Sorry we're celebrating quietly like this. It's much nicer. I agree. Well, ah, so do I, but it makes speech making more difficult. Well, don't do any. We'll drink the health and have done with it. No, we won't, Eric. It's one of the happiest days of my life. And one day, when, when you've had daughter of your own hope, you'll understand why. Gerald, I'm going to tell you frankly, without any pretenses, that your engagement to Sheila means a tremendous lot to me. She'll make you happy. I'm sure you'll make her happy. You're just the sort of son-in-law I've always wanted. Uh, your father and I have been friendly rivals in business for some time. Oh, look, Crofts Limited are both older and bigger than Burley and Company. Now, you've brought us together. And perhaps we can look forward to the time when Crofts and Burley are no longer competing. But are working together for lower cost and higher price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm sure my father would agree with that. Now, Arthur, I don't think you should discuss business on an occasion like this. Neither do I. It's all wrong. Oh, quite so. I agree with you. But I only mentioned it in passing. But, well, <laughs> what I wanted to say was, well, she is a lucky girl. <laughs> and I think you're a pretty fortunate young man, too, General. No, I know I am. This once, anyhow. <laughs> Here's wishing the pair of you the very best that life can bring, Gerald and Sheila. Gerald and Sheila, darling. Our congratulations and very best wishes. <laughs> Thank you. Eric? Yes, all the best. She's a nasty temper sometimes, but she's not bad, really. Good old Sheila. Chump, I can't drink to this, can I? When do I drink? Well, you can drink to me, Sheila. All right then, Gerald. I drink to you. And I drink to you. And I hope I can make you as happy as you deserve to be. Be careful, or I'll start weeping. Well, perhaps this will help to stop it. <clears throat> oh, I've got it. Is it the one you wanted me to have? Yes, the very one. Oh, it's beautiful. The inspector call, an inspector calls, um, set in 1912, uh, a rich family, upper class family. Um, we're celebrating the engagement of their daughter Sheila to uh, an equally refined Gerald Croft and uh, the father Mr. Building is very pleased about this because it's kind of joining up of uh, two, two companies together so they become richer and uh, so they're in a joyous occasion drinking and suddenly there's an uh, interruption the inspector arrives to ask some questions about the death of a girl that in itself is disturbing and in, intruding into their uh, privacy, the way they see what I express as a sort of cosy bubble that they find themselves in. Uh, you know, outside there's uh, poverty everywhere, but uh, they feel okay. And the inspector starts to disinsect them bit by bit and starts to, what unfolds is quite uh, disturbing in some ways. They all find themselves like, uh, so we're um, confronted with all these uh, accusations, which in turn, each one of them feel the guilt, which is uh, they had something to do with this uh, girl's death. But not letting, uh, I don't want to give the story away if anybody's watching, of course, at the end there's, a, there's, there's a quite an interesting twist. So we'll just leave it at that. You've got to remember, my boy, is Clothes mean something quite different to a woman. Not just something to wear, not only something to make her look prettier, but well, a sort of sign, a token of their self-respect. Yes, that's true. Yes, I remember. Well, what do you remember? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> it sounds a bit fishy to me. Oh, you don't know what some of these boys get up to nowadays. More money to spend and time to spend than I have when I was Eric's age. Oh, they worked us hard in those days and kept us short of cash. Well, even then we broke out and had a bit of fun sometimes. <laughs> yes, I'll bet you did. But this is the point, and I don't want to lecture you young fellows again, but what so many of you don't seem to understand now, when, when things are so much easier, is that a man has to make his own way, look after himself and his family too, of course, when he has one. And, and so long as he does that, he won't come to much harm. But the way some of these cranks talk and write now, you think that everybody has to look after everybody else. As if we're all, all mixed up together, like, like bees in a hive. Community and all that nonsense. But 
take my word for it, and I've learned in a good hard school of experience. A man has to mind his own business, look after himself and his own. And Somebody at the front door? Oh, Edna will get that. But we'll have another glass of port, Gerald, and then we'll join the ladies. That'll stop me giving you good advice. Yes. <laughs> you pounds on a bit to my father. Ah, uh, special occasion, you know, him. Ah, uh, feeling contented for once. I wanted you to have the benefit of my experience, sir. Uh. An inspector's call. An oh, inspector? What kind of inspector? A police inspector. He says his name's Inspector Ball. Oh, I don't know him. Does he want to see me? Yes, sir. He says it's important. Oh, very well then. Send him in here. Give us a little ride. Um, I mean, I think Mr. Burling is more or less unrepentant. N not just so much unrepentant, but not even terribly aware. Um, I mean, he expects that it's correct to pay people 22 and 6 when they can hardly live on it and not to give them 25 shillings when he's living in luxury. I don't think he really sees any um, any harm in that. Um, and of course today, if you're doing I mean people do the same thing of course today, but at least now perhaps they're, they're aware that there's something wrong. Well, what is it then? I'd like some information if you don't mind, Mr. Bonning. Two hours ago, a young woman died in the infirmary. She'd been taken there this afternoon because she'd swallowed a lot of strong disinfectant. Burned her inside out, of course. My God. Yeah, she was in great agony. No, they did everything they could for her at the infirmary, but she died. Suicide, of course. Yes, yes, horrible business. I don't understand why she'd come here. I went around to the room she had and she left a letter there on a sort of diary. Well, like a lot of these young women who get themselves into various kinds of trouble, she'd use more than one name. But her original name, her real name, was Eva Smith. Eva Smith? Do you remember her, Mr. Bowling? No, I, I seem to remember hearing that name. Eva Smith somewhere, but it doesn't convey anything to me, and I don't see where I can into this. Seems that she was employed in your works at one time. Oh, that's it, is it? Well, we've several hundred young women down there, you know, and they keep changing. And this young woman, Eva Smith, was a bit out of the ordinary. I found a photograph of her in her lodgings. Perhaps you'll recognize her from that. Is there any particular reason why I shouldn't see this girl's photograph, Inspector? There might be. And the same applies to me, I suppose. Yes. Well, I can't imagine what it could be. Neither can I. <laughs> I must say, I agree with them. It's the way I like to go to work. One person and one line of inquiry at a time. Otherwise, it's a muddle. Ah, see, what well, sensible reason. Oh, we've had enough of that. Poor Derek. Hmm. Well, it was very interesting for me when I first read the play because I immediately saw the uh, the fundaments of socialism, uh, you know, w woven in, in, in into the text and the ideas in the play. And then when I realised that the inspector didn't, you know, because normally when you research a character, you work out where have they come from where are they going to and so forth to get the background and I couldn't work out where this inspector comes from so I called him a spectre as opposed to an inspector he is a kind of a ghostly figure or he's a kind of a guardian angel in a way for this Eva Smith now we played this two weeks last November and then we sort of you know I had quite a strong character by then but now we're playing the second two weeks I've sort of strengthened it and dared to, to, to make the inspector a harder person, you know, because I was, I suppose I was nervous to do that at first because I thought, yeah, it needs a bit more subtlety, but I, I can really feel that he really dislikes these people. He's really, you know, sort of rubbing things in. He's really, you know, wants to, wants to get the dirty washing out, so to speak, of this sort of moralistic family or a family that's moralistic on the surface anyway. Um, so I, I, I get a, a lot of pleasure out of playing the character, I think, because he's on the right, you know, the side of righteousness, I suppose, in that sense, uh, I kind of enjoy it, you know. I'm really responsible. No, not entirely. A good deal happened to her after that, but she'll partly to blame, just as your father is. Well, what did Sheila do? I went to the manager at Millwoods, and I told him that if he didn't get rid of this girl, I'd never go near the place again. And I'd persuade Mother to close our account with them. Why did you do that? Because I was in a furious temper. What did this girl have done to make you lose your temper? Well, when I was looking at myself in the mirror, I caught sight of this girl smiling at the assistant. And I was absolutely furious with her. And was it the girl's fault? No, not really. It was my own fault. Oh, my 
picture. Would you really look at me like that? At least I'm trying to tell the truth. I expect you've done things you're ashamed of too. Well, I never said I had. Never mind about that. Settle so between you afterwards. Now, what happened? I've gone in to try something on. It's been an idea of my own. Mother had been against it, and so had the assistant. But I had insisted. As soon as I tried it on, I knew they'd been right. It just didn't suit me at all. I looked silly in the thing. Well, this girl had brought the dress up from the workroom, and when the assistant, Miss Francis, had asked her something about it, to show us what she'd meant, she held it up to herself as if she were wearing it. And it just suited her. She was the right type, just as I was the wrong type. She was a very pretty girl, too, with big dark eyes, and, well, that didn't make it any better. Well, when I tried it on and knew it was all wrong, I caught sight of this girl smiling at Miss Francis as if to say, doesn't she look awful? And I was absolutely furious with her. I was very rude to both of them. And then I went to the manager and told him that this girl had been very impertinent. And how could I have known what was going to happen then? I mean, if she'd been some plain, miserable little creature, I don't suppose I'd have done it. But she was very pretty and she looked as if she could take care of herself. I couldn't be sorry for her. In fact, in a kind of way, you might be said to have been jealous of her. Yes, I suppose so. And so you used the power you had as the daughter of a good customer and also of a man well known in the town to punish the girl just because she made you feel like that. Yes, but don't you see? It didn't seem to be anything very terrible at the time. And if I could help her now, I would. Yes, but you can't. It's too late. She's dead. My God, that's a bit thick come to think of it. Oh, shut up, Eric! I know! Total shock initially that she's that something that she has done has had an if, such a drastic effect like this, and then she starts to realise that actions that she's done can and other people have done can affect other people's lives, and she's just totally unaware of that. As she says, you know, she was pretty. She looks as if she could take care of herself. And I couldn't feel sorry for her, so she's got a totally superficial idea of life, and yeah, she's very very shocked about that and tries to then make the rest of the family realise that later on because they haven't twigged the whole idea why the inspector's there. I asked her questions about herself. She told me that her name was Daisy Renton and that she'd come from somewhere outside Bromley that she'd lost both her parents. She said that she'd had a job in one of the works here and had to leave after a strike. She mentioned the shop too, but she wouldn't say which one it was, and she was deliberately vague about what happened there. In fact, I couldn't get any exact details from her about her past life. She just wanted to talk and, 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 and be friendly, and, but at the same time she desperately wanted to be Daisy Renton and not Eva Smith. In fact, I heard that name for the first time tonight. What she did let slip, though she didn't really mean to, was that she was desperately hard up, and was at, the, at that moment was actually hungry. I made the people at the county find some food for her. And then you decided to keep her as your mistress. What? Of course, Mother, it was obvious from the start. Go on, Gerald. <coughs> Don't mind Mother. Well, not that night. Two nights later, when we met again, I discovered that, in fact, she hadn't a penny, and she was about to be turned out of the miserable little back room that she had. And now it happened that a friend of mine, Charlie Brunswick, had gone off to Canada for six months and let me have the key of a nice little set of rooms he had in Morgan Terrace. He asked me to look after them and to use them if I wanted to. So I insisted that Daisy move into those rooms and I made her take some money to keep her going there. I want you to understand that I didn't install her there so that I could make love to her. I insisted she go to Morgan Terrace because I felt sorry for her. And I didn't like the idea of her going back to the Palace Bar. I think it's, it's very hard. I think you have to um, s start by making him very arrogant and pretentious almost and, and smarmy and really feeling superior at the dinner table and being all charming to everybody to make his fall seem greater. That when he does, conf does his confession that it's, that, that it's believable that, that he's really embarrassed as well and that he's not only embarrassed but contrite that he actually does suffer not only because of what he's done but because of his fall from grace in the eyes of this family and then when he comes 
back in the third act he, c he can build that up again, at least with the parents, and, and hopefully try to do that with, with, with Sheila as well. But I think it's, it's partly just playing it um, super arrogant and, 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 and snotty-nosed, really, in, this, in, the, in the first part. Now, when did you see this girl again? About four nights afterwards. By appointment? No. I couldn't remember her name or where she lived. It was all very vague. But I happened to see her again in the palace bar. More drinks? Yes, all that time I wasn't so bad. And you made love again? Yes. I wasn't in love with her or anything, but I liked her. She was pretty and a good sport. So you had to go to bed with her? Well, I'm old enough to be married, aren't I? Well, I'm not married. And I hate these fat old tarts around the town. Who wants to see some of your respectable friends with? I don't want any of that talk from you! And I don't want it from either of you. Now, did you arrange to see each other again after that? Yes. The next time, well, the time after that, she told me she thought she was going to have a baby. She wasn't quite sure. And then she was. And of course, she was very worried about it. Yes, <coughs> so was I. I was in the hell of a state about it. Did she suggest that you ought to marry her? No, she didn't want me to marry her. She said I didn't love her and all that. In a way, she treated me as if I was a kid. Though I was almost as old as she was. So, what did you propose to do? Well, she had a good job. She didn't feel like trying for one. And she had no money left. So I insisted on giving her enough money to keep her going until she refused to take any more. And how much did you give her altogether? I suppose about 50 pounds or so. 50 pounds? On top of drinking and going round the town? Where did you get 50 pounds from? That's my question too. I got it from the office. My office? Yes. You mean you stole the money? Not really. What do you mean, not really? Arthur, oh, this is like I'm had so much inside wanting to come out, uh, so much hatred and bad feeling that it was the occasion where it was the time to release it and he took the brunt of it out on his mother, uh, feeling betrayed and um, also with his father standing up to him, uh, verbally abusing and aggressing that way. But uh, I think there's so much there built up over the years that this was the time to let it go uh, with an explosion and um, that's what he did.